5.15 a.m. I got a lot to do today, but there's no better way to start the day than with an amplified review for my amp unit. It's so early, the office studio looks like an undertaker entrance. Hopefully I paid the bills this month. Hold on, unit. Ah, there we go. The camera's rocking. The mic is jacked. Let's talk Raw 11-29-2021. Two title matches that absolutely befuddled BC. A five-on-five, ten-woman schmaz that left BC cringing. Oh, we're going to talk about it. Kevin Owens' booking is soaring. And Edge returns. And he wasn't alone. Hit that warning label. It's time to get amplified. All right, all right, all right. Party at the Moon Tower. There is no coffee establishment open right now, so I can't get a nice hot coffee. So we got to do second best, man. And it's a pretty good second option. These are my iced coffees, my tried and trues whenever I'm in a jam. And this one is exceptionally iced, man. I just put this into the freezer about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> so we're going to be good, man, with this ice Duncan. And then once I'm done with the review, we can get a nice, tall, hot coffee. Either Starbucks, Dunkin', or maybe one of the local establishments, man. That's the, the greatest thing about New York, man. If you're a coffee drinker, there's many places to choose from. My suggestion, try them all, man. Each coffee does something different to the system. Some coffees put me to sleep. Some get me amplified for days on end. Be lucky if I get an hour of sleep in three or four days. <laughs> anyway, we're going to get amplified and talk Monday Night Raw for sure. But before I do, man, I want to say a big thank you to my entire amplified unit. Everybody that's been along for the ride at any point in time during the last five years. If you caught the channel late last night, or evening anyway, a couple hours before Raw... You may have noticed we were celebrating, man. We celebrated, man. We did a live stream last night, a couple of hours before Raw, celebrating five years of amplification. Five years of the BC Amplified channel. Five years of BC. Five years of my Amplified unit. And it was one hell of a celebration. Uh, you guys showed up, man. Even though it was right before Raw. Even though it was with 17 minutes of notice, we had hundreds live. And at last check, thousands have already caught uh, that stream. So for the hundreds that caught it live, the thousands that caught it after the fact, every one of you who have been along for the ride, man, I mean this wholeheartedly. Get the first sip for you guys, because this is a massive salute, man. Five years. And if you guys missed that live stream, we weren't just patting ourselves on the back for five years, man. There was over two hours of pro wrestling news stories, hot topics, and really good discussion. So we, we absolutely crushed it for two plus hours last night. So for everybody that's been along for the ride these last five years, for everybody that took a moment to smash that subscription button, to smash that notification button, to smash that like on every fucking video, for every one of you, salute. And I mean that wholeheartedly, man. Salute. You guys keep this fucking channel rocking. So the first swig goes to my unit. And you know who the fuck you are too, man. From the rookie unit members that maybe just jumped on board this year to my veteran AMP unit members that have been rocking with BC for years. You guys are the fucking best, man. <laughs> All right, we've stalled long enough, man. BC's talked about his coffee. BC's talked about his... 
anniversary live stream from last night, but we do have to talk Raw for November 29, 2021. And we have to talk about it because we can't count on anybody else in the community to dish it to you like BC is about to rock it to you. So let's do this. The show starts pretty damn simplistic with Seth Rollins coming to the ring and declaring he's got breaking news for everybody. He says, do you want to hear the breaking news? Everybody says, yeah, we want to hear it. So he delivers this breaking news, which is that at the day one pay-per-view event for WWE, January 1st, Seth Rollins will be going for Big E's championship. Rollins, Big E, one-on-one. -on -one. On day one. That's his breaking news. <laughs> well, damn. That was some earth-rattling, stratosphere-shaking, jaw-dropping, mind-boggling, pulse-cascading breaking news, I'd say. We all could go to bed perfectly fine knowing that Seth Rollins was going to save the day and take on Big E. What a start to the show. <laughs> Slight sarcasm. All kidding aside, beggars can't be choosers, and we should be ecstatic that they actually announced a match for this card weeks in advance, because in 2021, we saw a problem that WWE has had in years past, but it was amplified, it was magnified, there was a spotlight on this issue, this problem, and it was cards not being completely filled out when the pay-per-view starts. I'm not talking a completed card for the go-home shows. That's bad enough that you do not have a completed pay-per-view by your go-home show. I'm talking when the actual pay-per-view is starting, there's been cards that were not completely filled and being rearranged while the event was happening. So to have a whole month between now and the day one pay-per-view and to have one of your two main events already announced, yeah... I'm going to fucking take that, man. Baby steps. This company has a million and one problems. Trust me. <laughs> and whether you even care about this match or not, I hear you. That's in the eye of the beholder. But the fact that we at least announced it, and now we can build upon it, hopefully. Baby steps, people. When a company has been this bad for this long, baby steps. Seth stays out there after this monumental breaking news. <laughs> was dropped. Um, and Rollins faces Finn Balor. This match was supposed to happen last week, uh, of course. Uh, but Rollins destroyed Balor pre-Bell, and then a chubby dude jumped the barricade and tried hugging Rollins or some shit. I don't, I don't even want to know, man. I don't even know what that was last week, man. But BC's not going to spend another second on it. And I love how Rollins isn't going to spend another second on it, man. Rollins came out this week like he was not phased one bit by what happened last week, man. Rollins looked even more obnoxious than ever. Rollins is jamming out to his own theme music. I love man. Rollins marking out to his own theme, electric. And I love that, man. That, that's a BC life lesson for you, a BC life hack. If you want to live a nice, beautiful life, one of the things you can help yourself do such is to take stupid people and stupid things and throw them to the wayside. Never give stupid people a second of your time. Never give stupid things an ounce of your energy. You'll be much better off, man. Rollins comes out like nothing, man. Even more electric, man. Even more obnoxious. And he has this match with uh, Finn Balor again. That was supposed to happen last week. The match was roughly 10 minutes, give or take a few seconds. But it was right at that 10-minute mark. And Rollins lands the stomp square on Balor's dome piece. Rollins picks up the W. Now, Rollins has the clear momentum heading toward day one. Um, and that's what needs to happen, right? I think it was Carlos. I think you asked in, in last night's stream, Balor Rollins, who, who wins? And I, I think my answer is the same it would be now, man. It would have to be Rollins. I don't want to see Balor lose. He shouldn't be in this position. But Rollins has to win because he's going for the championship. One of your main titles in, in about four weeks there's no way he can take this L, man. Uh, you you got to build this dude up bigger than ever right now. Um, and that's what happened for Rollins. But Balor, on the other hand, you think he's leaving WWE the way he's been booked. 
We're talking about Kevin Owens' contract coming up, Sami Zayn, all of these other wrestlers. I want to see what Balor's contract status is. When did he sign? When is his contract up? Is he asking for a release? Because his booking has been more than questionable. I mean, you look a few weeks ago. When he lost to Kevin Owens middle of Monday Night Raw, nothing on the line, just a clean loss to Owens, right there, BC was like, wow, that was kind of odd. And then just last week, he gets beaten down by Seth Rollins. And then this week, he just gets beat by Seth Rollins. That was his month of November booking. Ever since he lost to Roman Reigns at that pay-per-view a couple months ago, man, Balor's booking has been highly questionable. Um, and it's on life support, actually. I mean, Balor's booking. Balor is on in the breakdown lane right now. He needs somebody to stroll down that highway and pull over to the side to help get him jump started. Four fresh tires. Maybe just a clean jump start. Maybe switch up some spark plugs. Something needs to happen. You could say that with the whole roster booking wise, but Finn Balor really is desperate to get some good booking right now. Um, because he's taking a lot of L's and doing the job for several motherfuckers right now. And it just, it sucks to see how high he was going into that Roman Reigns match a few months ago at that pay-per-view. The Demon even came back to life. And now to see where Balor is, uh, I, you gotta think something's going on contractually. Uh, does he want out? I gotta keep track on that, man. And I'm gonna do some more research on that for you guys. Moving on, man, we got to go to Becky Lynch and Liv Morgan. Uh, they're out next for their contract signing. I originally thought this was for day one, but I believe this is for next week's Raw. Or by the time you're seeing this, the very next Raw, <laughs> you're going to see Becky Lynch, Liv Morgan for the championship. There might be some schmozzery, and that might lead to a, a pay-per-view match. Uh, but this contract signing, I guess, was for Raw next week, this upcoming week. Uh, they had a decent back and forth. We, <laughs> and I put in my notes here, man. I literally put the following words, man, that we have to remember that not every promo is going to be MJF CM Punk or even Eddie Kingston CM Punk, right? And ever since we saw those two promos, Kingston Punk a month ago and then MJF and Punk from last week, now we're just going to compare every promo to the two, so... I literally put this in my notes, and this is going to be telling. I mentioned this because there's about to be another face-to-face. -face. We're going to go over an hour or two with Edge and uh, The Miz. That's right. Two, two returns, man. Two, ret two returns in one, man. Two birds with one stone. And we're going to get to that in a couple of minutes. But it's interesting. I put that in my notes because I felt there was going to be a lot of comparisons with Liv Morgan and Becky Lynch to Punk and MJF. And I don't think that's fair. Because Punk and MJF are just on another fucking level. Individually, you put them together and it's beyond magic. It's beyond lightning in a bottle. But it was just funny that I put that down for these two ladies. And it would be even more relevant for Edge and Miz, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, but it was important not to like try to match them up. Because that's not fair to these ladies. Punk and MJF are on another level. Um... But this was decent, man. This was a decent back and forth. The highlighted zinger came from Morgan, uh, who says to Bex, and I quote, or basic, I mean, might be a slight paraphrase, but this was, uh, I mean, I wrote this down as fast as I could. This was basically a quote. You and your inflated contract is the reason my friends aren't here anymore. So during this back and forth, Morgan looks right at Bex and says, it's because of your big contract that you sign, your greed. That's the reason that I don't have my friends anymore. And of course, she's talking about former Riot Squad members, Ruby Riot, Ruby Soho, and Sarah Logan. And Logan was gone way before, though. But Riot, no question, man. She was part of those releases. And you knew that they were going to throw a bunch of money at Becky Lynch. Now... This was telling because in yesterday's anniversary live stream, five-year anniversary, BC hit you guys with a two-plus-hour live stream. And during that, I did a whole segment, man, maybe 15, 20 minutes in length at least, of contracts. 
So if you guys didn't catch that, man, go check that out, man. I, I gave you guys numbers on uh, current female roster contracts, how much they're making in salary per year. And I told you guys that Bex is making a million. She signed, literally, this was in this promo because it's real life. And Bex signed a million dollar contract. That is a lot of money, especially for the females, but for anybody. When you look at Owens, who's making 450000 Shinsuke, who's making 400000 um, Charlotte, who's making 550000 And then you look at Bex, who made... She came back for a million dollar payday. And Morgan is basically saying, bro, there was talent that could have been here. But your million, basically say you're, you're not worth a million, bro. If Charlotte's worth 550,000, you think you're worth a million? You know, and, and that leaves, I liked it because it's subject to, it's, it's a truthful discussion that we would have to have. A few years ago, when Bex was real red hot, Nia Jax broke her nose, and she's all bloodied in the crowd, and it was Survivor Series, it was fucking Raw versus SmackDown, basically, and we were heading into Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch. I mean, that's when she was on top of the world. That's when, yeah, you give her a million bucks. Times have changed. Fans are kind of iffy on Bex. Bex has kind of been iffy on herself. Um, and now you have to question, is she worth a million dollars? Could we maybe have given her 500000 just like Charlotte and maybe had two 250000 contracts? Maybe Ruby would have been there. Maybe Ember Moon would still be around. Maybe you cut Becky's contract and Mickie James can get 500000 because she's way more than deserving of a half a mil. I'm just putting some discussion out there, right? I mean, you could cut that contract... And you could have saved people, but no, budget cuts. But here we are giving a million dollars to Bex. And as I brought up in last night's live stream, uh, for those of you that caught it, man, Stephanie McMahon wants to, is real high on Tyson Fury. And I discuss in that live stream how that is, that's asinine. You just claimed budget cuts. You just claimed you didn't have enough money to pay these superstars, but you're going to give multi-millions to Tyson Fury to come in for one month, beat the shit out of one of your wrestlers, and then leave. And take those millions of dollars with them. Wouldn't it be best utilized to just keep your talent and book them properly? The fans will be much better off. Your company will be much better off. Because they're not going to leave with all your money. They're going to stick around. No, let's just keep bringing in outside influencers, outside fighters. Give them a big payday. Make your wrestlers look like idiots and chumps and losers to them. And then they run away with your money while laughing at us. That's not even shade to Tyson. Tyson is just the latest in a long line of individuals that have come into this company, collected millions of dollars, beat the shit out of the talent, and left. We already saw it with Tyson, Braun Strowman. He's released. Why? Because of booking like Tyson Fury, knocking out the big dude. Knocking out this choo-choo, chugga-chugga chain, chain reaction. You do that, the booking is just going to be a trickle-down effect. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. This guy came from the outside, beat the shit out of him. Here comes fucking that. And next thing you know, he's got fucking train sound effects. Next thing you know, fucking Hornswoggle is giving him a fruit roll up. These things matter, man. You, you, you got to realize that this type of booking is not going to help your roster. You bring in somebody just to beat the shit out of us. It ain't going to work. That's a side rant. If you want to hear more about that, go to the live stream yesterday, man, that we put out last night. Um, it's just, it's the celebration of five years on the channel. Click on that. That'll have the whole fucking BC rant. Um, but it goes back to this Becky situation, man, giving people million dollar contracts and, 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 and throwing all these millions to people like Tyson Fury. And then you, you claim uh-oh, we have to make budget cuts. Well, maybe if you, made, if you made the right decisions beforehand, you wouldn't have to cut people 
at a time where firing people is not cool, bro. Especially after you just declared that you were making all of this money, right? This was literally after that last fiscal meeting and conference call. And they talked about all this money that the company made this year. And then they turn around and go, oh, but, but budget cuts. We got to fire uh, another 17 people. Making that over 80 talent and over 150 employees in Stanford, Connecticut at the headquarters. Budget cuts. So anyway, the point is, I like how Live threw that in there because it does give that real life discussion. On the flip side, a lot of people kind of have a problem with them using the releases in storyline, using the releases in these promos it kind of makes light of it or it's like wwe doesn't care like it means nothing to them in fact if people are outraged let's just use that i'll make money off of it vince says so a lot of people are like it's in poor taste like we don't mind real life scenarios being played out in a promo in fact we like that part of the reason mjf and cm punk was so good man a lot of truth bombs being spit, and we knew it, man. Some low blows, some low jabs. But with something that is... I mean, this affected a lot of people, man. And again, this is at a time where there's so much uncertainty in the world, man. And now you're losing your job. And some of these people will get back on their feet and land uh, big-time gigs. Others, they won't. So for them to just use it... In the promo, some people were not having that. And that wasn't the only time, man. Edge and Miz would also reference some laid-off talent, some released talent, fired talent. Uh, when we get to that promo, we'll discuss that. Um, but other than that, man, um, it wasn't that bad. I mean, some people are probably going to just trash it because it's Bex. And everything Bex is doing... Whether she's a face, whether she's a heel, people are going to say it's forced, people are going to say it sucks, people are going to say it's cringe. That's in the eye of the beholder. I don't see all of the, uh, <laughs> I don't see all of this bad that others are seeing. I think she's much better as a heel, actually. Um, because she comes off as perfectly annoying. So you want to be a heel in that aspect. <laughs> So I'm not going to jump on the outrage bandwagon with this promo. I thought it was actually decent. Unfortunately, we didn't have a good end to the promo. Um, just Sonya Deville announcing a 10-woman schmaz for later in the night. Uh, Team Liv versus Team Bex. What the fuck? You got Bianca Belair on Team Liv with... Uh, who else was even on that son of a bitch? Bianca Belair... Uh, who the fuck? Rhea Ripley? Almost a superhero. Over on Team Bex, you got Carmella and Queen Zelina. And I'm just thinking, like, what does this do for any of them? Why would any of them want to be on Team Liv? Why, why does anybody give a fuck about this other person going for the championship? I wouldn't want to be on Team Liv. I'd sabotage the match, walk to the back, go get myself another coffee. If I'm Queen Zelina, why the fuck do I care about supporting fucking Bex's title reign? Please, I, I have queen duties to, to uh, obtain to, attend to. I'm going to do queen shit, right? If I'm Zelina, if I'm fucking Carmella, I'm going to get my mask washed or, or some shit. If I'm, if I'm a drop of dew, do drop, man. I'm going to fucking play with bubbles backstage. I don't see why anybody would support the challenger going for the championship or the fucking champion. Like, why is this a big thing? We just got done with the Survivor Series. Now we have a 10-woman schmoz match? To look forward to? And I use that term loosely because who's looking forward to seeing 10 females have this chaotic clusterfuck?
So I don't understand how we go from Liv and Becky to all of a sudden 10 females being involved. That's what this company does. It's the easiest way out. They don't have a finish to something. Let's throw everyone out there. They don't, they're not creative enough to set up side storylines for a division like tag team division, the women's division. They're not creative enough to have two or three things going at once. So let's throw everybody out there at once. That's why you see tag team turmoil matches all the fucking time too, right? Or fucking 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 fucking people out there. All the tag teams that WWE has in one match. Because they don't know what the fuck they're doing. They don't want to take the time to find out what they're doing. It's much easier to throw everyone out there. So we're about to go over that. I think that might be our number three. Ten female tag match, five on five. RK Bro versus the Dirty Dogs is next for the tag titles. Why and how do the dogs get a title match? Just last week, Orton Riddle, I call him, right? That was Matt Riddle dressed up as Randy Orton. Matt Riddle defeated Dolph Ziggler just last week. One-on-one. -on -one. In fact, the dogs haven't won a match since November 1st. That's the entire month ago. It's the last day of November right now. The first day of November is the last time the dog has even scored a victory. I know. I know. <laughs> I know by now. BC, relax with your facts, man. I'm not supposed to mention any of this. Screw your facts, BC. Lower your bar, BC. BC, you're doing what Vince doesn't want you to do. He doesn't want you to remember the past. Vince doesn't want you to bring up the past. Sorry, not sorry. I use logic and common sense when I follow a storyline or a match progression or a pay-per-view card that usually has culminating matches that are drawn from long-stemming feuds. I don't understand why we have a tag title match in the middle of a show with challengers that shouldn't be. You didn't book them as such. If you don't like it, just don't watch it, man. <laughs> How about I continue to watch what I love and I just try to make it better? How about I do that? It's funny. The people that say, if you don't like it, don't watch. It's funny because if you like it, if you like that type of book, you're the one that shouldn't be watching. <laughs> so my new phrase is going to be, if you like it, don't watch. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. Orton RKO's and pins a Ziggler. You knew that was happening, right? I, I mean, the, the dogs were not walking out with gold. These dogs, the only gold these dogs are going to have is maybe a fucking uh, a fresh collar that they can put around their neck. It's the only gold these dogs were going to get, man. This was going to end in an RKO. It was just a matter of if, if it was going to be the real Randy Orton or the fucking... Uh, the wannabe Randy Orton, the fucking um, um, uh, Orton Riddle, Riddle Orton. Who was going to deliver the RKO? It ended up being Randy Orton. I do like, I like the fact that he teased a roll up though, right? Because every match ends in a fucking roll up, which JR9, I don't know if last week's, was it SmackDown or Raw didn't have a roll up? I think Raw did. Maybe SmackDown didn't have any, but I don't think Raw had a, a roll up. I have to go back and, and check that out, but there hasn't been as many roll-ups in the last week, I've noticed. But I love how Randy Orton teased a roll-up finish, and, and off of the roll-up, he did the RKO, so that was pretty neat. See? See? I'm not all just a negative dude, man. There's a little bit of positive. I'm not surprised that the little bit of positive I gave was to Randy Orton. Randy Orton is still, even today, going into 2022 soon... Randy Orton is still one of the best wrestlers in the world. Um, and that ended our number one with that weird tag title match. We're about to kick off our number two, Edge and Miz face-to-face. -face. Let me get a big swig of coffee first. Salute.
So Edge kicks off hour two with his return to Raw, man. Much publicized, marketed. Everybody talking about, you know, what's he coming back for or who to go against. And even, even Randy Orton kind of asked, he pulled his own people on his social. Like, who do you guys want me to come back and face? Who do you guys want me to come back for? And they actually used this in this promo because it wasn't just Edge that came back, man. About a minute after Edge's music stopped and Edge started talking about all these names that he could be facing in the future, Miz with Maurice returns to Raw. Now this is the... Now I know, you're, I know, I know. The Beast, like, oh, Miz, wow, yay. Who gives a shit? <laughs> I hear you, man. The way they booked Miz, I mean, I mean, how excited can you get? I always like the Miz. Um, <laughs> just the dude, man, Mike Mazanin. I, I just, you know, he's a pure dude, dude. He's, he's such a good dude, and uh, he really does give everything for that company. Uh, I mean, everybody talks about John Cena and how he just did everything for that company, no matter what. And, Blah, blah, blah. Even to the detriment of the company, man. Um, John Cena didn't get out of his own way to let other people do so much for the company. Miz had to kind of go his own route to become a company guy. But, uh, I like Miz. His booking just never gave any of us a reason to give a shit about the Miz. And that's where there's a disconnect. But I always felt that the best Miz is when he's with Maurice. Not only because she's, I mean, she's a beautiful woman, obviously. She can actually go in the ring, too. I felt her first run with that company, man, was cut way too short. Um, and she just vibes so well. She understands that industry. I mean, she could be gone for months, years. And when Maurice comes back, she's just in it, dude. She's an entertainer. And, uh, and a wrestler, if she ever decides to do such full-time. But I love seeing Maurice come out with him last night. I, I really did. I can't tell you how much uh, of a difference it is with, with Miz. And, uh, I think with uh, Morrison gone, um, Vince was really receptive to the idea of having Miz with somebody. Who better than fucking his wife, Maurice? So anyway... We have this face-to-face -face now on our hands. Edge, Miz. Um, now, the original word was that Miz was coming back closer to Royal Rumble. So, you gotta wonder if Miz's return was moved up from the Royal Rumble to the day one pay-per-view with Edge because of CM Punk's promo on MJF last week in which Punk told MJF, and I quote, he's just a less... Famous Miz. That's what Punk told MJF. You're just the less famous Miz. And following that line from Punk, Miz's name was trending on social. And you gotta believe Vinnie Mac wanted to strike while the iron was hot. And he wanted Miz back on his show. That's what this company does. If any, if WWE or any of its wrestlers gets any mainstream publicity... Vince wants to capitalize. He doesn't give a fuck if Miz was the blunt of the joke. He doesn't give a shit if another, if a rival company used the line. Vince is going to strike as long as it made those public headlines. And that line was all over the place, man. Uh, it, it wasn't just lo localized in the community like a sports media. This was on ESPN. This was publicized in Forbes. This was all over the fucking place. So obviously this got back to the company and I think they, they rushed the Miz's return. They even start the promo. And this is what I caught, man. Go back and check this out, man. They started the promo just like MJF and Punk did last week where MJF was pissed because Punk... Punk said a bunch of names that he wanted to face in the future, and MJF was not mentioned in that list of names. So that's why MJF has this beef with Punk. Well, Miz said that he's pissed because Edge mentioned all of these names that he wants to face in the future, and Miz, 
and his name was not one of them on the list. So there was a lot of similarities in in this promo, why Miz has beef with, with Edge. It was the same reason MJF had this beef with CM Punk. So just a lot of similarities. I caught that shit at the jump, man. In fact, Edge actually mentioned Punk's promo in his promo to The Miz. <laughs> Legit, man. Edge said, and I quote, You even got people on other shows mentioning your name just to get a cheap reaction. I'm going to say that again, man. Edge looked right at Miz and said, you have all the talent in the world. You have everything working for you. Basically saying you're your own worst enemy. You're the reason you not you didn't get even farther. You're the only person dragging yourself down. You know, so Edge is actually pumping up Miz. And in the process, he says, you even have... You even have people on other shows mentioning your name. Mentioning your name just to get a cheap pop. A cheap reaction. So it's a little bit of a diss to CM Punk. Saying that Punk needed to get this cheap reaction off of using the Miz's name. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. I love Edge. (laughs) But I don't think Punk needed to bring up the Miz. I think that promo was going to be straight fire anyway. That just put it over the top. But uh, they actually mentioned the other company, man. But I thought, now I was told by Vince McMahon, the owner, the chairman of World Wrestling Entertainment, I was told just a couple months ago from his own words, we all were told that they're not even competition. Vince said that AEW isn't even in WCW's league. They're worlds apart. Well, you're mentioning them on your show, bro. You're not mentioning an ROH that is soon to be defunct. You're not mentioning Impact or New Japan Pro Wrestling or the local dinky bingo hall down the road. No, you're mentioning what AEW is doing. And you know, you know it's because they're grabbing all of the the mainstream headlines lately. Your company has not been. So, I mean, this was obviously by design. Edge then told Miz... You achieved all of this just as a stepping stone to your next reality show or your next dance show while you left your partners high and dry to get fired. Damn. Now that was obviously a direct reference to Morrison. Now again, this brings up one of those things where on one hand you're saying, ah, this is good, man. This promo is getting personal. It's straight fire. And this is Edge doing what Edge does best, man. He's lighting the mic up. But on the other hand, just like Liv Morgan telling Bex, man, it's because of your contract, I don't have my friends here anymore. You got greedy, and because of that, people lost their job. But, I mean, you have people that actually did, man, Ruby and such, and they're probably thinking, oh, now I'm just being used in promos. Well, you gotta he- feel for Morrison here, man. Poor Morrison is like, okay, not only did I lose my job, but they're actually using this to progress other storylines. They're using this in a feud. So, you know, on one hand, BC wants to say, oh, stop, it's not a big deal. But, I mean, it is kind of tacky, man. You know, it's almost like WWE feels so free to just use these releases like it's a joke. Like just a line, a zinger in a promo. That's what I don't like. I don't like that they... They just don't even realize how big this is, how massive this is, not just to these people's careers, their livelihoods. And it's not a joke, and it's not just a one-line zinger for these people. A lot of these people will find their their way back in the industry. Some will sign lucrative contracts and big organizations. Others, maybe much less money, but at least they'll be working. And some will just not have a job. That's the harsh truth. So I love when it gets you know, reel in these promos and we can dish these zingers and we get our ooh-ah moments. Man, I just feel this is kind of tacky because it's all too real, man. And it's not cool. The releases were just not cool when you just bragged about how much money that company made. And then you turned around and the same day that you bragged to the press that you're making all this money, on the same day you released all of those individuals 
And then it's just like you're laughing about it, man. Let's just use this, man. Yeah, let's use this. Let's, let's use Morrison's release to make the crowd pop. I mean, I love Edge, but like he's saying, CM Punk, to get a cheap reaction, used Miz's name. Well, wouldn't this be the same type of deal, man? You're using somebody else, somebody who's been released to get a cheap reaction. I don't know, man. It's a discussion. You guys have a, a view on it, man. You know, sound off on it, man. To each their own. I just, I was kind of in the middle on this, man. I was kind of complexed by it. And uh, I just think that that's how McMahon does see everything, man. McMahon is just on to the next. He does not give a fuck if these people land in, 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 with a job or they land in the welfare line. They don't give a fuck in this company. The old bastard doesn't. And, and his fucking yes men don't. Especially his new right-hand man, man, Nikki Khan, man. Promo ends with Edge telling Miz to jump if he wants to throw down. Miz says no and walks away. Again, very similar to how Punk and MJF's promo ended. Punk's ready to throw down, MJF's like, check you. Just so similar, you know? Um, and, and you know they were drastically, drastically... Influenced, I think that's the word I'll use. Influenced on CM Punk and MJF's promo. I mean, it was written all on this thing, man. But I enjoyed it still for the most part. <laughs> you know what I mean? You want to copy what they did? Hey, here's a fucking thought. It worked for a reason. If you start doing more of that or trying to with the right people, Edge is one of those people that can light up that fucking mic. Um... Maybe we'll get more captivating television. Crazy concept. What Punk and MJF did work so well because it's Pro Wrestling 101. <laughs> it's the simple foundation, the core of pro wrestling that it was built and founded upon. So we could say Edge and Miz, they're, they're just like basically re trying to recreate that promo or however way you look at it. Good! Good! <laughs> it's like they lost their way. If another company can help this company find their way, good. Everybody will profit in the end. And that's how that ended, man. That's going to set up Edge and Miz going forward. And Maurice. Maurice is back. Maybe she wrestles a little bit, man. Miz and Maurice in the future, man. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, here's a crazy concept. Maybe Beth Phoenix comes out of retirement. Beth Phoenix and Edge versus Miz and Maurice at, uh, at Mania. Maybe they're setting up a long feud, right? Day one, maybe they take on it with one another. Miz totally destroys Edge, almost ends his career for good this time. And at Royal Rumble, Edge wants the ultimate revenge. Who knows? And all of a sudden, the ladies get involved. Can that last December, January, February, can that go four months? Would you guys care about a Miz Edge four month feud? Maybe that's a bit long. Maybe they take on each other one on one at day one and then at the Royal Rumble, we get a mixed tag match. I don't know. I'm just thinking of ways you can kind of get Maurice back in the ring, which I would love to see. And I would love to see Beth Phoenix, who's the wife of Adam Copeland Edge. That could work. I don't know, man. Brainstorming over here, man. Maurice is back. We got to utilize her best way possible, man. Every way. Alpha Academy versus the Street Profits is next. Omos and AJ Styles is on commentary. AJ Styles is on commentary. Omos is just kind of standing behind him like a two-story treehouse. Built and stacked fucking massive. Um... A tree house. I don't know where I got that, man. It's early. I told you. I mean, BC's off the rails. A two-story tree house. <laughs> where the fuck did I pull that from? You guys ever build tree houses growing up? I never did. I What we did is we built underground forts, man. There was a bike pit in the woods, and, and you would, uh, a bike pit, you know, for fucking like, like BMX style, and we had all these jumps and shit, and in a little bit of the distance, we would, 
like 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. We would just dig these massive fucking holes, put boards in there, big fucking platform boards, man, and we would, like pallets and shit, and we would build underground forts, brah. We never did too much of the tree shit. We had a, a tree swing at one point, real high in the fucking, real high, man. We did this, we put a tire at the end of this rope, and, and it was a, and you'd walk up the tree, you'd go up, we built the steps, and you'd carry the tire with you, and you would just fucking fly with the tire, man. And it was the scariest motherfucking shit. Let's just say, BC ain't no Reggie. You know what I mean? You ain't gonna get a lot of flips and dives out of BC. So those were some oh shit moments. What the fuck brought that up? I don't know, man. We're in left field with a hockey stick. The, 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 the tree fort story is probably more entertaining than Alpha Academy and Street Profits, which was less than five fucking minutes. Uh, Montez Ford defeats Chad Gable via the frog splash. Well, that's that's great for the Profits. How do you not feel bad for Chad Gable and Otis, man? Otis! Can we just think about Otis for a second? Otis was your Money in the Bank winner. He had the briefcase. It looked like he had all the momentum. Fans were getting behind that character, man. He was quirky, but he was so much fun. And he could go in the ring. And all of a sudden, Vince says, No, we're taking the briefcase from you. We're putting it to the Miz. He takes the briefcase from Otis. Then he absolutely strips down his confidence. And then he sends him to NXT to get repackaged. And now he makes him this mean mugging force. And then he still books him like a loser. I mean, I feel so bad for Otis, man. And Chad Gable has all the talent in the world. You'd never know it because he never gets the chance to show it. So great for the profits. This does nothing for Gable and Otis. So this brings me to what I always tell you guys. Why do they always put people in the ring that can't afford to lose? When you know somebody's going to have to lose. That's the importance of jobber matches. The profits, if the match is going to be less than five minutes anyway, four, three minutes, then bring out jobbers, local enhancement talent, Danny Dipshit Dugenheimer, Fuckwad Fred, Luigi Lugnuts, Polly Walnuts. Any one of these individuals would be glad to get some airtime. And then you have the profits destroy them. The Viking Raiders should be destroying local enhancement talent. T-Bar, who should be Dominic Dijakovic, he should be destroying local enhancement jobber talent. People are going to be much more intrigued with watching Wrestler A completely destroy Wrestler B. It's going to be way more engaging, way more entertaining than watching another substandard wrestling match where you know people got to lose that shouldn't be. And Damian Priest versus Apollo for the U.S. title uh, ends our number two. Oh, no, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That's not the end. Damian Priest for, uh, versus Apollo was just literally stuck in the middle of the show. It didn't even end an hour. This was a U.S. title. Let me get a swig of coffee. Hold on. I'm going to get a big swig for this because this is another one of those title matches that makes zero fucking sense. Give me a second. Alright, thank you for that, because I, I needed that jolt of amplification here, because Damian Priest versus Apollo for the U.S. title, but wait, why? Big question mark. How? Big question mark. How and why does Apollo get a title shot? Apollo only has two victories since August 1st. Two, I, I'm not seeing my notes the research that I did, right, I double, I triple checked it, my notes are not lying to me, Apollo, it says right here, he has two victories since August 1st, August, August, September, October, November, four fucking months, two victories, his last win was in October, his last win wasn't even... The month is over right now. This is the last day of November. He's got zero wins in November. His last win came in the middle of October. October was his last win. He's only got two since August. I know. 
I know. BC, take your facts somewhere else, man. Take your facts somewhere else, Beastly. Basically, just sit back and enjoy it, man. Why do you always got to remember this stuff? Can't you just think, hey, maybe Apollo deserves it because he's a talented guy? Of course he is. That doesn't mean you just get title shot. John Morrison is talented as fuck. He didn't get a title shot last night. He doesn't even have a job anymore and he's talented as fuck. Alistair Black, Malachi. He's working for another company right now. He had all the talent in the world. He's not in WWE going for a U.S. title. No, he, he doesn't even work for the company anymore. I go on and on. It's not just about talent, bro. You have to book them. This is... Oh, fuck. Please. If I may. I feel a BC like fucking... Um, uh, a BC... Professor BC lesson coming on here. This is why I say what I say. I'm not just, I don't just have a shtick on this platform. I don't un understand how many times I have to say this. It's not a shtick. I'm not just the crazy guy on the tube that yells about pro wrestling for no fucking reason other than to be negative, to have a shtick so that I can try to gain viewership. I promise you, I've been doing this long enough. Yesterday we celebrated, last night we celebrated five years on the channel. I've been doing this long enough to know that if I'm super positive, I can get a much bigger audience. Much bigger ad revenues. I'd be made. More subscribers, more viewership, more money. Yahoo! So why don't I just do that? BC, change your shtick. Be more positive. It's because it's not truthful. There's no truth in it. The truth is I started this five years ago for one main reason. To help make this better. Pro wrestling as a whole. The industry. Here we are five years later. I'm not going to change my mission, my mission statement. My mission statement remains, I'm here to try to help professional wrestling and all these companies. Cody, Cody for AEW asked us to tell them what AEW is doing right and wrong at all times. I take that seriously. Vince McMahon didn't ask us to do that. I'm still going to tell him exactly what he's doing right and wrong. Every time, every show, every moment, every match. From maneuvers to mannerisms, BC's going to dissect it. It's not a shtick. I'm literally breaking this things, these things down for you because they're not small issues. The reason booking matters, every single match that these wrestlers are in, every match the booking is so important, is because when you finally get to something like a title match, it has to make sense. You have to feel it. You have to feel the intrigue, the excitement to watch this dude go for a title. There has to be a feel. It could be a face and you really want him to succeed, or it could be a heel. And you're like, ah, oh, I can't stand this motherfucker. He's going for the gold. Oh no, man. Are they going to give it to him? He's capable. I remember when this happened and you beat the shit out of him, man. If he hits him with that move, it could be oh, right? You think about it. Back in the day, you, you, you loved to think about the past. Because it got you to the point where you're at for the match. The story got you to the match. So when the pay-per-view was on and you were seeing a title match at the pay-per-view, you remembered their entire history, their storyline. And that's why that match for the title is so intriguing to you. Nowadays, nope. Title matches are just on the fly. We're just getting fucking Damian Priest and Apollo like that. Apollo is in a title match when he was not booked to be eat anywhere near a fucking title. Apollo doesn't even deserve to be winning the 24-7 title with his booking. And that's not shade to Apollo. I love Apollo. Apollo does have all the talent in the world. But if you don't book him as such leading into a title match, nobody's going to take this serious. People are going to wonder, wait. Wait, Apollo jumped everybody on the roster? He jumped the line? I'm pretty sure if I go through the Raw roster, even though everybody's pretty much booked poorly, I'm pretty sure I can find a plethora of individuals that won a match or two in November. So wouldn't that put them in front of Apollo just based on that alone? Again, these are my facts that I bring that everyone says, don't think about that, BC. Pro wrestling is based on storylines that we want to remember when we get to a culminating match. It shouldn't be... Now we're in a day and age where... 
we're told, we're wanted to stop remembering the past. Don't remember the storyline. And McMahon doesn't want us to remember the storyline because more than likely, there wasn't any. I'm on to this son of a bitch, man. And it's been effective. His mission statement, man, just forget what you fucking once knew. This is what you're getting. And fans that defend this, they've lowered their bar so low that they will defend anything that McMahon does. And they'll actually take something like this and they'll accept it. Something that is so damn unacceptable, they will easily accept. It's bullshit, bro. Apollo would remain winless in November because sure enough, he got handled via the reckoning by Priest. Priest retains his championship, so... <laughs> So Priest gets this title shot out of nowhere when he doesn't deserve it booking-wise. And then he just loses after 10 minutes anyway. So now, if you thought he didn't deserve it beforehand, now he really goes to the beginning of the line. He remains winless in November. And he remains going into December with only two victories since August. Everybody thought, oh, this new character change, man, was going to mean the world for him. Yeah, just like Otis's heel turn, right? Otis is really being booked dominantly. Oh, yeah. Commander Sneeze. Ha-chum! We're all allergic to Apollo's booking. You could add Commander Sneeze in there. You could add fucking Corporal Sniffles. You can add in fucking Captain Cough. It won't make a difference. You can add in a, a bunch of different... Uh, 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 Accents. It's not going to matter. If you don't give him the time of day, if you don't put the effort into his booking, it's not going to matter, bro. Nobody's going to want to see Apollo on their screens. It's sad. Real life, such a good dude. You know, it's easier if these dudes are like assholes in real life. That's like, oh, fuck them. Who cares? You know, but so many of these dudes are so nice, man. So awesome, you know? They mean well. They want to do their best. Most of them too afraid to step up to McMahon. Especially with all these releases, man. I mean, these poor wrestlers today, they probably don't want to answer their phone. Not for their mama, not for their girlfriends, not for their significant... Nothing. Because it might be that Stanford, Connecticut number. Anyway, our number two ends with uh, Ray and Dominic Mysterio versus Cedric and Shelton. They actually refer to them as the Hurt Business. <laughs> Please, the old bastard has ruined them. Now, they're just out of business. In fact, Dominic Frog splashes Cedric for the W. So Ray and Dominic, the Mysterios, they get this victory. And Cedric and Shelton once again fall in defeat. So now this business is just collecting debt. <laughs> this business is just collecting debt. Not only are they lose, they become jobbers. They've been losers. They become jobbers. Not only have they been out of business, but now even out of business, they are collecting debt. And just like in real life, when you have debt, man, it takes a long time to get out of that hole. You have to dig yourself out of debt. These losses are piling up so much on Sel Shelton and Cedric. They are becoming so irrelevant that honestly, and, and this is going to be truthful, man. This may sound like it's a little exaggeration, but it's true. Cedric and Shelton, individually or as a team, they could have 10 victories in a row. 10, that's a lot. More than a couple months worth of victories. Ten in a row. Most people still wouldn't give a fuck. That's how bad it is for Cedric and Shelton. That's our number two. Let me, uh... Hold on, let me, let me get over to the page of our number three, man. Oh, it doesn't get any better. You ready for this, man? Our number three with the ten women tag match, five on five? Fuck. Fuck. 
So our three starts with this clusterfuck of chaos, I call it. Five on five, ten women tag match. What could go wrong? <laughs> Fuck! Let's just send our whole women's roster out there. Bianca Belair, Liv Morgan, Rhea Ripley, almost a superhero, Dana Brooke. They're all on one team out there posing like a motley crew of misfits. Um, and on the other side, you got Bex, Queen Zelina, Carmella, A Drop of Dew, and Tamina. And I am not joking. You can go back and watch for yourself, man. That crowd was asleep from bell to bell. I take no pleasure in saying that. I respect so many of the females in this match. You guys know how high I am on Bianca Belair. Um, and how high I've been on Queen Zelina and Carmella, actually. You're raw or women's tag team champions. I've been really high on Zelina and Carmella. And that may draw a lot of criticism in the community. Oh, uh, BC, man, come on, Carmella and Zelina. Yeah. And I'm not going to go, I mean, if you haven't seen past videos, go back and watch me. I'm really high on them for the reasons that I gave in those reviews. So, I mean, there was a lot of talent in this match that I, I just... It was so sad to see them booked in this clusterfuck that did nothing. Nothing. It was supposed to, I guess, add more intrigue for Liv Morgan and Becky Lynch in their title match. It didn't do that. And why is, why is the whole roster trying to get that match over? Just get creative. And use them too, Liv and Becky, to do their thing. Have other storylines built for that. Are you going to tell me, oh, well, well, in this match, it's the, um, the Drop of Dew and Bianca were continuing their feud as well. And Rhea and almost a superhero was continuing a feud with the new tag champions, Carmella and Zelina. Is that what you're going to try to sell BC on? All of these feuds were all in one match? Please. Nobody looks at Carmella and Zelina versus Rhea and almost a superhero as a feud. It's not a feud. Having matches all the time is not a feud. I just had this, this discussion with uh, AEW fans who said they have no problem with Britt Baker losing to Rio last week. Your women's champion, Britt Baker, lost in the middle of a show, not even the main event, lost in the middle of a show to someone half her size via a fruit roll-up. So she got rolled up, her shoulders held down. That was the move. It was not a finisher. It's not like Britt Baker was knocked out. She was just held down by someone half her size. And that's the best way to utilize your women's champion? And you know what the response was? Oh, well, basically, it's the storyline. The storyline is that Rio always beats Brit. Brit cannot beat Rio. That's the storyline. Isn't it exciting, BC? And BC's like, are you fucking... Have you lowered your bar that fucking low that you're intrigued by that as a storyline? What's the end goal here? Does Rio win a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time, and then on a seventh time, Britt wins, and we're all like, wow, she did it. She finally beat Rio. Is that the story that we're supposed to get giddy about? And on top of that, a roll-up, bro. Your, 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 your champion got beat in the middle of a show by a roll-up by somebody half her size, and you're, you're just like, it, it's fine, Beastly. The storyline is Rio always wins. No, no. The storyline cannot be you just have a match all the time. Because that's what you're telling me. Rio and Britt just have a match all the time and Rio always wins. That's the storyline. And then one day, Britt's going to win, BC. That's the story. You can't have a storyline that way. There's no feud between Rhea and almost a superhero versus Carmella and Zelina. That's not a feud. They're just having matches together. Hope that makes sense. Bianca and a drop of dew has a little bit more of a feud, I guess. Uh, it looks like a drop of dew doesn't know what she wants to do. Who she wants to feud with. So don't try to sell me that that made this 10-man tag any more special. No. Liv Morgan and Becky is what this all was for. It just didn't land. But from bell to bell, you go back and watch, man. I take no satisfaction in saying this. Because I have so much respect for most of these females. All of them, actually. But I'm high on many of them. And it was sad to see how, how that crowd was, man. Uh, that crowd did not give a fuck about that match. Um, and there was one point where all of the faces, I distinctly remember this, man, and I even put it in the notes because I was just mortified by this. I, I was honestly like, it was a cringeworthy moment. 
there was a point where all of the faces, Team Liv, they started clapping. You know, if you're not tagged in the match and you're on the apron trying to get a tag and you're trying to will the competitor in the ring to get back on their feet, right? And the crowd is kind of on a lull. You start clapping, right? That's what you do in a tag. You start clapping and usually the crowd on autopilot just starts clapping along with you. So there was a moment where all the faces Team Liv actually started clapping to get the crowd making some noise. And nobody, nobody even budged in the crowd. Guys, back in the day, no matter how bored an audience was, it was like autopilot to clap back with the wrestlers. Your subconscious just took over and everybody became a sheep. And everyone's just like clapping along, right? Even if you were bored, man, you saw the other wrestlers clapping, you clapped. Um, I really did feel bad for these ladies. I mean, they were all, this wasn't just one, it's not like a simple tag match where one person is clapping to get the crowd back. You had four other ladies clapping and the crowd didn't give a fuck, bro. I've never seen anything like that in pro wrestling. Usually the crowd claps or at least a shitload of them. I felt bad for these ladies in that, uh, at that point in time, man, I, I was, I, it was a cringeworthy moment for BC. Professional wrestling fans absolutely support women's wrestling. I want to get that out of the way right now because I know there's going to be comments. Well, BC, that's because women's wrestling doesn't sell. Nobody likes women's wrestling. That's bullshit. BC loves it. So right there, that, that comment is just so wrong, man. You don't like it. That's fine. Don't speak for the rest of us. Um, And I think I speak for most pro wrestling fans when I say that we absolutely support women's wrestling, but the promoter has to care. Whoever the head booker is, the promoter of the company, the owner, the CEO of a company, they have to care. These types of matches show that you do not care. And if the company does not support women's wrestling, then the fans can't really fully support it the way they would like to. The truth. You can sit there and just blame the fans for being so non-responsive during this match. But you also got a place to blame on the old bastard from Stanford, Connecticut, VKM. Because for months, for years, this is how he... This is how he parades his female wrestlers out there, man. He doesn't care to set up all these other side feuds. He just wants to put them all out there in one clusterfuck. It's hard to give a fuck about anything that's going on when you just have all these fucking bodies, man. Ten motherfuckers in there going every which way. I hate schmoz matches anyway. But when there literally is no point right after the Survivor Series, and this is all for what? To have Team Liv and Team Bex? The crowd wasn't that fucking stupid. They know nothing was on the line. They knew there was no reason to care. So here's a crazy concept. They didn't care. Like internally, they had no feeling of care. That's not their fault. I'm pretty sure most of them, if you ask them, absolutely support women's wrestling. But if Vince McMahon doesn't support it, then they're all fucked. Liv Morgan hits Oblivion on Tamina for the W. This was the only call... That could have been made. If the whole thing is supposedly for Liv Morgan versus Bex, Bex is your champion. You gotta keep building Liv up to be a viable competitor. Liv has to win this match. There's no other way you could go here. Not even my beloved Bianca Belair. This had to be Liv Morgan. Morgan hits Oblivion on Tamina. Uh, and collects that W. Um, Post-match, Morgan hits Oblivion on Bex as well. Look, Bex is clearly keeping that title next week. We know that. She's not going to drop the title next week to Liv Morgan. But no matter what, I hope they keep doing something with Liv. I really do. Because this is her fucking time. And I'm seeing her improve by the fucking week, bro. And it's, Same thing I say about Zelina Vega and Carmella. And it just looks like they're getting their groove. I see that with Liv. I mean, that women's division. Whether you love these individuals or not. Or like some of them, but not so much the other. They're starting to step up. Man, I just hope that Vince McMahon steps up for them. The main event was Kevin Owens versus Big E. If Owens wins, he's added to the day one title match. 
Uh, I do like how they went about this, with Owens tricking Rollins into thinking he was already added to the match, thus putting the thought into Pierce and DeVille's dome piece. Because earlier tonight, Owens is like, oh, you didn't hear the news? I'm in the match. And Rollins is like, no, no, you're not. What are you talking about? And Rollins is extra obnoxious with this new character, which I love. And uh, Owens is like, yeah, ask, ask the little, the, the, the bald guy in there who's in charge. Yeah, he, he just put me in the match. Meaning Pierce, of course. So then in a following segment, Rollins goes in there and asks Pierce. And Pierce is like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I don't, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. No, I didn't add anyone else in the match. And Rollins is like, all right, I knew he was lying. All right, I knew it, I knew it. And he walks away. And now the thoughts in Pierce's mind, like, hey, that would actually be cool. Pierce runs it by DeVille. And DeVille's like, actually, that's a good idea. And Pierce is like, no, nah, we can't do... You think? So, then they make the decision that if Owens beats Big E, then you know what? You're at it in, man. So then Rollins storms into Pierce and DeVille's office, and Rollins is like, what are you doing to me? <laughs> He's like, I, I thought he was lying, but you lied to me. You, you told me he wasn't in the match, and now you're telling me he's in the match. You're lying to me. And then... Pierce is like, well, he originally lied to you, not us. And he's like, no, he was telling the truth. You're li What is happening? And Rollins storms off all confused. I loved it, man. Rollins played this off perfectly, bro. Perfectly. So, uh, this, is the, this is one of those blue moon occasions where they did something right here with Owens. Owens is being booked really good as of late. It's one of two things. He re-signed. I think he re-signed with WWE already. Or they're really pushing for this thing. I mean, it's close. And he just needs to dot some I's and cross some T's with this type of booking. There's no more comparing this to Dean Ambrose. Dean Ambrose was just in the limelight because he had to give Roman the rub. They wanted that one last shield reunion. It, it was nothing for Dean. Dean was being booked like an absolute fucking joke, man. He was wearing that stupid fucking coat. And talking about how the fans have cooties. The only reason he got that big push at the end, and he knew it. Look at all his last interviews with WWE. It was because he knew he had to give Roman a push. This is all on Owens right now. So there's no more comparing this to Ambrose, man. This is Owens getting a huge push. And he's in a title match at day one. His contract officially ends in January. The pay-per-view is in January. He's going right to a title main event to, to AEW, possibly? I don't know, bro. We don't have confirmation on what he's doing, but this booking, either he re-signed or Vince McMahon is doing some bad shit because this dude's about to leave with all the momentum in the world. But, I mean, this looks b beyond, like, uh, we're going to give you a lot of good stuff to try to keep you here. I mean, this looks like they already have a deal in place because this guy's in a title match a week before his contract ends. This is fucking huge. Main event status. Um, Because he did win this, man. This little spoiler before I even went over the match. I guess I just spoiled that, man. Owens did win this shit. I like the way the whole fucking story arc went off last night. You get to the match. The match was the better part of 20 minutes, actually. Maybe even a little more. Maybe a minute less, but it was around that 20-minute mark. And once again, Owens plays games with Rollins, who was on commentary. Owens attacks Rollins earlier in the match. Rollins thinks twice, oh, no, I'm not going to attack you because you want, you want me to DQ Big E. So he, he holds it. But then Owens later in the match, he... Dex Rollins even more. I mean, he starts pummeling him, so Rollins has to respond. So he pummels him, Owens gets back in the ring, and Rollins is right there to follow and starts beating the shit out of Owens. The bell is rung. Big E is disqualified, meaning Kevin Owens wins the match, and he will now be implemented into that title match at day one, making it a triple threat schmoz match. Um... Because, again, Rollins retaliated. Subsequently, Big E is disqualified. Kevin Owens wins and is, and is added to the pay-per-view match. That's huge, man. They, they really dedicated time to make this work. I, I, I do appreciate that. I ask for the bare minimum for everybody that says I just bitch, moan, complain, and yell for no fucking reason other than to be negative. You don't know what you're fucking talking about. BC does bitch, moan, complain, yell, scream. <laughs> but it's justified. 
all the time. Because nothing ever makes sense in this company. They just make schmoz matches for no reason. Triple threats, fatal fours, they don't make sense. The competitors in the match don't make sense. None of it. This all makes sense. Owens has been being booked strong lately. So, okay, he's in a title match. Makes sense. He's beating people like Finn Balor. Beating people like Big E. Makes sense. But on top of that, they made a story out of adding him into the triple threat. Whether it's a good story to you or not, that's in the eye of the beholder. I get it. But at least it's something. What I tell you earlier, baby steps. When a company has been this bad for so long, baby steps. It doesn't mean we're necessarily lowering our bar, which I promised you I will never do for you guys. And I hope you never do the same. We don't lower our bar for Vince McMahon. But we have to take the baby steps to get to where we need to be. Rome wasn't built in a day. It's a process. It's a step. Baby steps in the right direction, man. They made a story arc. I can get behind this triple threat a little more now because they're making a little bit more sense out of it. I ask for bare minimum. And when we don't even get bare minimum, you get an electric amplified man. That may make people cry in the community. Now, Beastly, so me, man. He's a boogeyman. He's such an asshole, that Beastly. But if you listen to every fucking word that I'm spewing, there's no lies detected. It's all fucking truth. It's all right there. The proof is in the pudding. The facts are right there for you to do the research upon. But you don't got to. That's what BC's here for, man. I will do the work for you. You just got to listen up. Class just has to attend session. And Professor BC will start lecturing, man. Anyway, that's going to do it, guys, for this review. Monday Night Raw, 11 2021 Thank you for shooting the shit with BC, man. Till next time, think, be, live, amped, always. Red Team, go! Check you later. And again... Thank you to everybody that made last night's live stream, the five-year celebration, the five-year anniversary of this very channel. Thank you for making that so damn special. All right, now for real, until next time, check you.